researcher is 100% sure this is what happened at the Dyatlov Pass. The Dyatlov Pass event refers to the deaths of nine Russian hikers in the Ural Mountains between February 1st and 2nd, 1959. The hikers, who were students and alumni of the Ural Polytechnical Institute, headed off on a mountaineering excursion and never returned. Later, when search and rescue crews located their campsite, they discovered that the tent had been ripped open from the inside and that they had suddenly evacuated the tent and ran down the snow-covered slope to a nearby tree line. According to authorities, some of the hikers had died of hypothermia, while others had perished from severe traumatic injuries. Various explanations for the fatalities have been postulated, including an avalanche, a clash with indigenous people, and even a covert Russian military operation. In this video, we are going to look at a new theory on the Dyatlov Pass incident. Teodora Hajiska, co-author of the book 1079, The Overwhelming Force of Dyatlov Pass, is 100% certain that her theory on what happened to the hapless hikers is correct. New theories pop up from time to time, and any new theory needs to be stacked up against the existing ones to compare the likelihood of it. There have been many theories proposed to explain the mysterious deaths of the hikers in the Dyatlov Pass incident. Some of the most popular theories include an avalanche. One theory is that the hikers were caught in an avalanche and were forced to flee their campsite in the middle of the night. However, there were no signs of an avalanche at the campsite, and some of the hikers were found with serious injuries that are not consistent with being caught in an avalanche. They were attacked by indigenous people. Another theory is that the hikers were attacked by indigenous people, possibly the Mansi, who are native to the area. However, there is no evidence to support this theory, and the Mansi denied any involvement in the deaths. The Russian military was involved. Some have speculated that the deaths were caused by the Russian military, either as a part of a secret mission or as a cover-up of some other incident. There is no evidence to support this theory. And natural causes. Another theory is that the hikers died as a result of natural causes, such as hypothermia or exposure. This theory is supported by the fact that several of the hikers were found with injuries consistent with hypothermia and by the extreme cold temperatures in the area at the time of the incident. No one theory encompasses all the available evidence to make it 100% credible, but Teodora Hajiska's credentials and her knowledge of the incident might just get us a little closer to the truth. Traveling to Russia to speak with those in the know, visiting the site, extensive searches through archives, publishing a book, interviews conducted, and keeping the peace on discussion forums on the subject most likely makes Hajiska one of the world's foremost experts on the decades-long mystery. Hajiska's theory has three main components that, when put together, in her opinion, make the narrative of the incident more believable than the more than other 75 theories doing the rounds. And if you're thinking, did UFOs or the Yeti make the cut, they certainly have. Hajiska's theory is a perfect storm of bad luck, a freak accident, and a totalitarian state's saving face tactics to protect its image. The geologists, the hikers, and the cover-up. The first part of her theory postulates that the hikers never erected their inadequate tent on the slope where it was found in the search and rescue mission. This tent was made to be erected and tied to two trees, not on an open, wind-battered slope. According to Hajiska, the tent was pitched a mile below the slope, in or near the forest line, near a giant cedar tree. They understood the disparity in protection between the tree line and the bare, weather-vulnerable terrain up the slope. Risking their survival by pitching the tent at a location where the tent could be further destroyed by the ferocious winds would have made the option of where to pitch the tent obvious. After settling on a site inside the tree line, the nine hikers would have immediately divided up the campsite responsibilities. They would have set up the tent, installed their heating stove, and collected firewood for a campfire and the tent stove. There is evidence that someone climbed the cedar tree and chopped off branches since the tree barks had skin fragments and its branches were cut. Due to the night's severe winds in the pass, the hikers are unable to build a fire. The corner of the tent was most likely lined with boots, while backpacks and jackets covered the floor of the tent. 
the nine hikers slept side by side in varied positions on each side of the tent stove as the tent and the stove heat were the only things separating them from death that night. On February 1st, between 7.30 and 8.30 p.m., quote-unquote, the incident that would test their survival instincts occurred. There is some disagreement about these times, but they were calculated from the time on the hikers' watches that were found. The Geologists Geologist miners, conducting an aerial survey in the southern parts of Mount Otorton to find magnetic anomalies in quest of uranium resources, might have set off this whole catastrophe. The geologists searched for chlorine-rich soil, a black mineral containing uranium. To perform similar surveys in 1950s Russia, geologists used 5-kilogram anti-magnetic, anti-tank blasts that exploded in mid-air, often just above the treetop level, sometimes igniting the tree crowns. These geologists, who often worked on weekends, conducted one of these bombing missions on Sunday, February 1, 1959. Sappers, as these geological miners were known, had in the past repeatedly caused negligent deaths as a result of irresponsible blasting. Neither the Dyatlov 9 nor the Sappers were aware that the other group was present in that location on that day. The reverberations of such blast mining may have displaced or dislocated weak, decaying, or dead tree branches in the area. Hajiska believes that while the nine hikers were sleeping in the tent, a big branch or even a whole tree broke off, badly destroying and confining the tent and its occupants and inflicting injuries of various severity on all nine hikers. The Hikers Doroshenko and Krivonoshenko presumably passed away first due to deadly burns and cerebral trauma. This may be the result of being crushed by the limbs or tree's heaviest part. As they were pulled out of the tent by the others, they were likely unconscious and extremely close to death due to bodily shock and the freezing weather, and their bodily systems started to rapidly collapse. In a state of shock and despair and unable to lift the tree limb to retrieve their coats and boots, the survivors were compelled to remove the deceased men's garments for heat to preserve their own lives. The corpse of Yuri Krivonoshenko was recovered under the cedar tree. He was wearing an undershirt, a long-sleeved striped shirt, swimming trunks, long underwear, a ripped sock on his left foot, and no shoes. Yuri Doroshenko was dressed in a sleeveless cotton undershirt, a checkered shirt with short sleeves, shorts, swimming trunks, and blue cotton underpants. On each foot, he wore a separate pair of wool socks, and the socks on his left foot were burned. The corpses of Igor Dyatlov, Zenaida Kolmogorova, and Rustam Slobodin would be discovered facing up the hill where they had left a labaz, or cache of supplies. The assumption is that in an attempt to retrieve an emergency medicine box they had stashed there, all three went off course and were separated. Eventually, they succumbed to the weather and collapsed in the snow at very distances up the slope owing to extreme cold, injuries, and shock. It took almost two months to find the other four hikers. They were finally discovered on May 4th under 13 feet of snow, in a ravine 246 feet further into the woods from the cedar tree. A den made with branches was a common method for surviving harsh winters, and given the circumstances, it offered the best chance of survival for those who remained behind, in the hope that their three friends would reach the summit of the mountain and bring back supplies. Cedar branches were carried inside the den and arranged to reduce the amount of contact between human bodies and the snow. A disturbing truth is that the four corpses were discovered within feet of their makeshift shelter in the deepest part of the canyon. Why would they abandon their only shelter? The Cover-Up For those of us who grew up in the Cold War era, understanding Soviet mentality is easy. For those who didn't, Let's give you a breakdown of how the Soviet Union operated in the era that this disastrous incident took place. During the middle of the 20th century, the Soviet Union was a totalitarian state, and its citizens understood that if they made a mistake while working for the government and wanted to avoid a Siberian gulag, torture, or death, they had to cover it up and never speak about it again. In 1959 Russia, when a comrade admitted wrongdoing, his co-workers and family were subjected to inconceivable repercussions. The USSR was the world's second most powerful nation at the time, enthusiastically contending with the United States for the top spot. Under Stalin, Khrushchev, and the increasing strains of the Cold War, the government had to present an aura of unwavering dominance in all matters. 
a communist ideal centered on the perfection of its methods and its people. There was absolutely no political will or tolerance for the fact that sometimes people made errors. If the university hikers accidentally got in the way of geologists searching for uranium in the northern Urals and as a result, deaths occurred, that error in judgment could never be publicly acknowledged in this type of society. A mistake in the workplace might become a matter of life and death, not just a bad mark on one's employment record. This onerous way of life required a continual balancing act between public duty and self-preservation. This thinking is how the cover-up and secrecy mentality in this event evolved. The USSR would never publicize when or where they were exploring for uranium. This was classified as a state secret and any accident would be covered up by sowing the seeds of disinformation and confusion. Hajiska has theorized that the whole scene of the tragedy had been restaged by authorities or the geologists themselves so that the accident looked to have been caused by some force of nature. From purposely made footprints, missing knives, and a total overkill of manpower from the regional government for the search effort, someone or a group was trying to make it look like a natural occurrence. To restage the incident, the conspirators needed only to exchange the lobaz for the tent. This explains the smooth, leisurely snow footprints down the hill, as well as the curiously positioned and untouched belongings in and around the tent set on a slope. According to Ajiska, the fallen tree branch that injured the hikers was simply chopped up and discarded. In the 21 days between the time of restaging and the discovery of the slope tent, the restagers might have swept away any more boot prints and let the wind and snow do the rest. But why go through such lengths to make it look like the hikers died from natural causes? The heads of local government and the geological unit knew from experience that they could be imprisoned or executed for the incident as had happened to a colonel of the railway troops who was convicted of a similar crime, the death of subordinates in a fire, and was sentenced to 25 years in prison in 1950. Due to the passage of time and dealing with investigations conducted by traumatized citizens of an unforgiving totalitarian state, we may never know the true story of what happened in the Dyatlov Pass in 1959. What we do know is that people like Teodora Hajiska will most likely never give up on the search for truth, and in this case, justice, for the nine hikers that lost their lives in the Dyatlov Pass event.